I would like to invite Professor Zahra and Dr. Shirin Kahin to um, start the following session. Professor Zahran, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ghada. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sabah al-Khair ala hadaratkum jami'an. Inshallah, liqa wa muqtamar muwafaq. Wa sa'id bu wujudi ma hadaratkum al-naharda fi al-jalsa al-amma al-ula li fa'aliyat al-muqtamar illi bi'an'aqid haza al-am في ظروف يعني مختلفة شوية عما تعودناه وبيتناول النقلة النوعية اللي تمت ولا زالت بتتم في التعليم العالي استجابة لوباء الكورونا المستجد فيروس كورونا المستجد بداية بعد الترحيب بحضراتكم والسادة الحضور أرحب بالأخت العزيزة الزميلة الأستاذة الدكتورة شيرين كاكيش من الجامعة الأردنية من الأردن الشقيق مش عاوز أتكلم كتير لأنه إحنا يعني حوالي تقريبا تلت ساعة بيهايند سكاديول فحنبدأ على طول الجلسة بتاعتنا أستاذن حضراتكم الميكروفونات كلها تبقى مقفولة وإذا كان في أي أسئلة ممكن في الشات بوكس والدكتورة شيرين هتساعدنا في ان احنا بنجمع كل الاسئلة وفي نهاية السيشن هندي حوالي تلت ساعة للاجابة على التساؤلات بتاعتكم بتاعت حضراتكم والمداخلات الخاصة بالسادة الضيوف العارضين احنا النهاردة عندنا سيشن متميزة بنبدأ بيها بنشوف البرسبكتيفز او المنظورات المختلفه الاستراتيجيه من خبرات دوليه متعدده عندنا تحديدا اربع دول هنشوف في فرنسا ازاي تعاملوا مع المشكله وازاي ناويين يتعاملوا معاها وكذلك في دوله الامارات العربيه المتحده والسنغال كدوله فرنكوفونيه حتى هنعرف برضو تجربتهم كانت ايه واخيرا وليس اخيرا في لبنان هنتعرف على بعض الامور اللي تم تناولها على غرار ما تم تناوله في الجامعات كلها استاذ حضراتكم اتكلم باللغه الانجليزيه للترحيب بسادة الزملاء ثم هنترك الفلور علشان المتحدث الاولاني يتكلم Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you and welcome to you all in uh, our APITEL 2020 uh, conference. As you all know uh, and has been said in the past hour or so, there is a paradigm shift in the higher education in response to COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, what we are witnessing today is we are trying to focus on this first session, plenary session on uh, the various uh, strategic perspective from uh, different countries. Uh, we have uh, four eminent speakers today. Uh, we have, uh, we will uh, uh, witness with you uh, the experience uh, in, in France, in uh, UAE, in Senegal, and in uh, Lebanon. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me uh, just quickly uh, introduce our first speaker for today. Uh, we are glad and delighted to have uh, Professor Bernard uh, Hazenkopf. Uh, he got his uh, PhD from Université Louis Pasteur at uh, Strasbourg, and he is a professor at uh, Université Pierre and Marie Curie, uh, l'Institut Parisien de Chimie Moléculaire. Uh, he has supervised uh, many uh, theses, over about 13 theses and postdocs. And uh, he has participated in almost 25 PhD committee only during the past uh, five years. Uh, he has been active, actively participating in many international conferences uh, based on being an invited speaker. And uh, he has uh, many contributed communication and he has given 
um, almost 20 or even more seminars in universities uh, all over Europe, in Canada and in the Far East. Uh, he is also uh, very active in terms of funding. He is currently uh, working on uh, four uh, projects. Uh, his funding record during the past five years uh, amounts to almost 300,000 euros, and he has uh, almost about uh, 52 uh, articles published uh, and, uh, and also reviews, and he has more than 2,000 citations. Without further ado, I really welcome uh, Professor uh, Hazenkoff, and I leave the floor to uh, Professor Hazenkoff, and uh, we are we will try to limit ourselves to a 20-minute uh, speech. Uh, I know Bernie is, is is ready for that, and uh, I really urge you to keep the time 20 minutes, and then we will save the last 20 minutes in the session for uh, question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I will try to share my screen. And so I hope now you see my screen. Is this the case? Yes, it's very clear. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Well, uh, your excellencies, uh, distinguished presidents and directors, dear colleagues, dear sir, madam, I would like to stress that it's a real honor for me to speak to you at this very important meeting, I think, where you have the leaders of uh, Le Confremo together with the people who are working on the ground to solve these challenges that we are facing at the moment. We already heard about it. Um, well, this is what happened to us a couple of months ago. Uh, about the same day as uh, in Egypt, I just learned the lockdown in Paris on March 16. Oh, and I admire the fact that you have um, already prepared for it since January 17. Oh, wow. I have to say that we did not prepare for that. Sure. Is, the, is the sound OK? I hear some other sound. Should I continue? Yes, please. OK. So well, um, since March, our faculty uh, was at home. Our lecture halls were empty and we had to adapt to the situation rather rapidly and uh, this is what we did so we learned a lot about uh, video conferences uh, we are using zoom in paris not microsoft teams but that's about the same we were flooding our students with pdf files we were recording video conferences uh, or small video captures in improvised studios like the one here uh, so we were doing something that is called emergency remote teaching. Uh, this was, of course, just a shift, a temporary shift of the delivery mode of our instruction. We went from uh, on-campus instruction to online instruction. And this was only with the goal to maintain the access to the instruction during this crisis. Uh, and it was done with total improvisation because we did not have the support infrastructure. We did not have all the equipment in the beginning. We had to buy it rather fast and we did not have the knowledge in the beginning. And I think that was this case in most universities. We just heard about it in of what you have done in, in Alexandria, which is quite impressive also. So that was as a response to a crisis, but um, we all know also that the virus is still around and that we have to live with it for a little bit longer, maybe much longer. And so we have to think what we can what we can do now. And of course, from a sanitary point of view, we can say, well, let's separate students and teachers from each other and let's move to a total online education. And that's, of course, a possibility. And online education can be done very nicely, can be done with a lot of success. But it is something that you have to prepare and there are a number of aspects that you a number of parameters that you have to take into account. I just summarized a few of them on this slide here. Uh, you have to think about the modality if you want to do it totally online or maybe keep some uh, on campus teaching. The pacing is important if it's self paced or class paced. The student structure ratio it's not the same in online teaching for a big crowd or if it's a small private online course. 
the pedagogy is important. You have to build in the assessment and in particular also the summative assessment. We just heard about the numbers. I'm pretty much impressed about the numbers of um, um, distance evaluation that you have done in Alexandria. We have to think about the role of the instructor and the students when they are online. You have to think about the synchronous synchrony do you want to do it all synchronous or asynchronous and you also have to build in feedback in your online education and think about who is giving feedback is it the teacher or is it maybe also some peer students so a lot to do on for online education and if you do this then probably you can separate teachers and students and have a very healthy sanitary situation but it's certainly not the situation that we want to have in our university. Actually, neither the faculty staff nor the students want to have a total online education. Um, our students are coming from high school. Um, most of the times it's the first time they are abroad from their home, from their parents. Um, they want to live their life. They want to live with their peers. They want to meet them. They don't want to sit only in front of a computer. And we as teachers, we also want to have the contact with the students. We do not want to teach only in front of the machine. And so we were quite happy that now we can get back to the amphitheaters, to the lecture halls, and this is how we are teaching at the moment. So with a little bit less crowded lecture halls, everybody is wearing a mask. I have to sit there and can, cannot run around anymore. I can still write on the blackboard, of course. So this is how we are doing it. Um, this is the on-campus teaching and this is replacing uh, only part of our teaching because as you can see the lecture halls are no longer filled so some of the teaching is still online. And so we were discussing with colleagues how to do this online teaching and what are the best ways to do it and so I would like to talk about three different modes that we came up with and most likely all other universities come up with also, and the advantages and disadvantages that we see in these different modes, video lecturing, co-modal teaching and blended learning. I would like to point out at this point that I'm not talking about the digital, digital divide here, the fact that not all of our students can access in the same way online teaching. Um, I can't talk about it for the lack of time, but I would really like to stress that this is a very important point that the universities have also to think about the digital divide and also have to address it and also have to make sure that all their students have the same access to online teaching. So let's have a look at the different modes of online teaching. So video lectures is the first mode. It's that one is very easy to, to think of. Um, the teacher is performing in front of a camera in the same way as he would perform in front of the classroom. And the students are accessing it <coughs> through an online medium, whatever it is, Zoom, Microsoft Teams or whatever. Uh, there are some advantages of this. The first one is that it's very fast for the teacher to set it up. Actually, you take your class and you just put a camera uh, in front of you and you do the same thing as you have always done. Uh, it needs a minimum of equipment. Uh, a webcam and a microphone is enough, so usually a simple laptop computer can do it. There are a number of disadvantages of the, this, and the first one I would like to stress is that students get very passive. Actually, they watch the teacher like they would watch a Netflix series on a screen and um, are no longer doing anything that is enhancing their learning. And so, of course, a very passive student is a student who is not learning a lot. And so, as a minimum, you would have to put into your video lecture some exercises, cut them into smaller parts and get uh, students more involved. The other problem is the lack of feedback. Feedback for the students. They don't know if they are advancing fast enough or not in the learning and also the lack of feedback to the teacher when we are standing in front of a lecture hall we can feel as a competent professional we can feel more or less how the students are reacting and if you are going too fast or too slow and so on and of course if you are doing it by video 
then you don't have this feedback. Actually, a little bit like me at the moment, I'm talking to you. I don't know if you follow me or not because I can't really see you. And finally, a point that is important is the student fatigue. Uh, usually, a uh, student day is from the morning to the afternoon on the campus, and he is listening to some lectures, he's going to the library, he's doing some exercising classes, and so on. If you replace all this by a video lecture, and the student has to watch for six or eight hours something on the screen, um, then he will just uh, probably he will fall asleep in front of that, and he is not learning anything anymore. So, of course, this is very clear to every one of us, and nobody would ask a student to listen six hours to his own lecture, but this means also that we have to think about what the other colleagues are doing on the same day. So, if I decide to put a video lecture for two hours on a given day, I have to make sure that not all of my colleagues on the same day are thinking about the same thing. So, there must be more collaboration in order to do that. The second point that I would like to suggest is co-modal teaching. I don't know if you know this term, maybe you know this approach as the high flex approach, or it's called in some universities in Canada, a hybrid flexible approach. That means that you have part of your students in front of the teacher in a classroom, and some others are following uh, at distance. This can be either synchronous or asynchronous. So either you transmit live what is going on in the classroom or you record it and they're watching it later on. Again, there are advantages for this. Um, so first of all, there's still the personal contact, at least in the classroom with the smaller crowd and the teacher. So this is something that we all value. So we keep this and we are doing classroom teaching, though these are our usual teaching activities. We don't have to think about much something else to do. At least this is what most of most people think in the beginning. The disadvantages of this is that you have suddenly multiple audiences. So the teacher has to address not only the people who are sitting in front of him, but he has to think also um, about the people who are watching him at the distance on the screen. And just to give an example, this means that he has to think about, do they hear everything that is going on in the classroom? If the teacher is the only person who has a microphone and he is asking a question to the audience and gets an answer from the students in the classroom, then all the people who are sitting on behind the screen will not hear anything and they will be totally disconnected from what is going on. So that is something that you have to think about and there are many more things to think about. Also, if there's a discussion going on in the classroom, the people at distance can't follow that. You need rather heavy equipment, especially if you want to do it synchronously, um, because you probably have to put uh, several cameras in the classroom and you have to have a very good internet connection in order to stream this live. Uh, and the final point is that you're fractioning your student population because most likely some of the students will always stay behind the screen, will never come to the classroom and the others will always come. This is especially the experience from the Canadian University Laval. Um, they give their students the total choice, they can come or not come to the classroom, and they found out that about three quarters of the, of the students are um, always keeping the same mode. Half of them are always coming to the classroom, a quarter of them are always staying at home, and only a quarter of them is changing between the two modes. So as there are the different audiences, if you want to do co-model teaching, uh, you must start with a very um, serious micro planning for, for each of your sessions. So starting with the learning outcomes of your session, you have to think about what you are doing as a teacher during this session, and you have to think about what all of your different student audiences are doing. Once again, you don't want to have passive students, so you must think about what they are actively doing while they are following your lecture. And this has to be done with every single session. But if you do this correctly, if you invest this time, then probably co-model teaching is not a bad choice. The final um, choice that I would like to discuss with a little bit longer is blended learning, um, something that you probably all know about. Blended learning is 
instead of separating the student audience into some of them at home and some of them in the classroom, you are separating the learning content. Some of it is done in the classroom with everyone, all of the students, and some of it is done um, at home, all of the students. The advantages of this is that you have the personal contact as before. You move automatically to a more student-centered learning because now you are thinking about the student activities and what is done in the classroom and what is done abroad. So you're thinking about what the student is doing. And it is also the most sustainable and the most resilient solution, at least um, what I think, because if you build now during the COVID crisis, a uh, blended learning approach, you can also use it afterwards. Blended learning is also very uh, interesting if, for example, you want to have different audiences, if you want to have a class for people coming from different disciplines, um, then if you reduce the number of hours that uh, you are teaching on class, it's probably much, much easier to find a schedule that is fitting different disciplines. Of course, there are some disadvantages also. First of all, there's a lot of time investment involved in this. And if you want to split uh, correctly the student activities, you need some pedagogical know-how. And I would like to show this in the last couple of minutes. Um, I think you have to go back to the learning outcomes, the activities that you want that your student is able to perform after your teaching and then think about these activities given in a context uh, that he is able to do after your teaching and then think about the activities that the student is, uh, should do during your teaching in order to acquire those learning outcomes. And these student activities can be organized in different ways. I usually use this organization from Diane Lauriard from UCL in London. Um, you can think of student activities like acquisition, which is reading a book or reading a PDF file or watching a video. Then they can do some practice like doing exercises. They can do some investigation, doing some uh, their own research in, in publications or doing research on the ground. They can be involved in discussion within uh, the student group or with other people. They can do collaboration where they have to produce a common outcome, or they can also do some individual production like writing a report or anything like this. And now you can go to your typical class and think what of these activities do you want to have at distance and what of them must be still face to face. So just as an example, you can think of a typical class that is starting with some distance activities. The student is doing a quiz at home that be, can be done on Moodle or whatever, any learning management system to remember what he has learned the year before. Uh, then he can read a text or watch a video to get some new content and doing some exercises and problems. And then he is coming on the campus and he is meeting the teacher who, who can give him some more explanations, who can answer questions, who can exchange and go deeper in the in the different matter and you can then repeat these sequences as many times as you want. I'm coming from a scientific faculty so we also have laboratory courses and you can have the same thing for a laboratory course. The student can start at home with establishing a protocol and then he is coming on the campus in order to do in a laboratory the manipulation where he needs the equipment or something that cannot be done at home and then he's going back home or somewhere else, so no longer in the laboratory to do the analysis and the interpretation. And at the end, the student is preparing for his final exam and he will be assessed um, in a summative way at the end in order to get grading. You can also place some other grade points during the, the course. So for example, you can create the exercises. Don't create the very first exercise. There must always be a training period, but then you can create also the exercises or you can create the laboratory outcomes. So in the end, with this example, you have about 13 hours that are distance and about four hours that are present on the campus. And so this also shows you that 
well, we take care of the sanitary situation where we have to um, do a lot of teaching outside the campus in order to separate the people. And it is a way, if you design it like this, that is very resilient because you can adapt rather easily if you are allowed, if the sanitary situation allows you to have more people on the campus, then you can put some of these things back onto the campus. And if the sanitary situation requires to have less contact, then well, you do some of these things also in a distance, for example, by video interactions. So this brings me to the conclusion. I think I show to you that video lectures are rather straightforward, but I think they have very little pedagogical value. Co-model teaching is a very interesting and attractive way, but it's really challenging for the teacher if it's well done, because the teacher is actually has to do multitasking. Uh, the blended learning approach has, in my, from my point of view, very high pedagogical value and sustainability or resiliency, and is the way that actually I prefer and I would advocate for. Finally, I hope I showed also to you that it's always important to go back to the learning outcomes and then from there decide on the learning activities, then decide on the learning environment, what of these activities must be done on the campus and what can be done outside of the campus, and only then decide about the digital tools or the analog tools that you want to use in order to do this learning and teaching. This also um, gives a hint to what the universities should do. Of course, we must, as a teacher, be trained in digital and analog tools, and we need support for that. But we need support for the whole chain here, and so the universities must also think about how they can support their teaching staff in order to define learning outcomes and the rest of the chain in order to do this, and not only concentrate on the digital tools. Is this I'm about 20 minutes now, so I would like to thank you for your attention. Shukran, and I'm open for any questions that you have on this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hasenkopf, and thank you for keeping the time. We really appreciate it, and I can see the comments that uh, everybody is thanking you for uh, this uh, valuable presentation, and uh, uh, we'll keep uh, possible question at the end of the session if you don't if you do not uh, mind uh, so thank not. you again for being with us and uh, uh, probably you will stay with us until the end of the session and uh, get uh, possible questions